Today I sit down with serial entrepreneur Dean Draco. Dean pretty much sums up the Pareto distribution, having started and run several large companies. We discuss his time at Barracuda Networks, IC Manage, Eagle Eye Networks, his acquisition of Brevo, and his car company Draco Motors. The common thread throughout this conversation is how AI impacts these various companies and how it can be used in these seemingly disparate industries. So now, sit back and enjoy this conversation with Dean Draco. Glad to be here, Robert. Uh, I know. It was a little rainy out there, wasn't it? Uh, a little dreary, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, there's, there's been quite a few accidents out there. It, t- it took me like 45 minutes to get uh, maybe less than 10 miles, like eight miles or something the other day. I was like, I left five minutes early, and I should have left 25 minutes early. <laughs> I, was a little, I was a little nervous about getting here on time as well. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you made it. So um, I remember... Uh, reading at some point that you you started Apple in like the 80s. Is that, am I, did I read that right? Yeah, I think it was, um, I started at Apple 1988 or 89 uh-huh. um, in the um, non-Jobs year, non-Steve Jobs years. Uh-huh. Uh, John Scully was the CEO at the time I joined. How, how did you find your way to Apple? Was that just a, you apply for the job or is that... Um, cause even by that point it was a fairly well-known company. It was, it was, it was kind of interesting. I, I applied, um, I was, I was at the university of Michigan and then I went to UC Berkeley for grad school. And from UC Berkeley, I worked some summers at HP and I had an odd job offers from HP and, uh, a few other computer companies and Sun and, um, the team at Apple, um, seemed like the ones that were going to actually, you know, make a difference, change the world, do exciting things. And the opportunity at Apple was in doing both hardware and software, whereas all of the other opportunities kind of wanted to position you in either hardware or software. And I liked the opportunity or the idea of being able to work in both areas at mm-hmm. Apple. Mm-hmm. And so I had, um, I had 11 job offers from Apple. <laughs> what? <laughs> did they know each other or making those offers or well they they coordinated it you know and i went in and interviewed with like i don't know 20 people in one day and um because i had already done some semiconductor design and i had done published a software program you know i was uh, you know they were like excited and so i got an offer from the printer group an offer from the operating system group an offer from the hardware group you know all these different groups and they coordinated it and, you know, all the offers were the same amount of money, but I had my choice of, of which team I wanted to go to. I see. And which team did you end up on? Um, I ended up on the Mac team, mm-hmm. uh, Mac hardware team, uh, doing graphics and uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Well, that certainly grew to be a thing. Uh, <laughs> did you get some good shares along the way? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. You know, but um, I left. I try to remember when I left. It was in. But, the, but, but what was it like there? I mean, that, that's sort of one of the that's the early heydays. Um, it was yeah. It was um, anything was possible. Okay, um, and Apple was um, you know important and relevant and doing great things and. Um, but it was, um, you know, the people were amazing. It was an amazing group of people. All of the people I worked with, the, you know, I don't know, the 25 or 50 people that I worked with closely, like more than half of them went on to go and found their own companies and really? create things. Yeah. And it was an amazing kind of um, attractor for people who wanted to do things and get stuff done um, much more so than many other companies Mm -hmm. so that was probably the most exciting thing we worked crazy hours um i mean apple kind of almost gave silicon valley its name Uh, (laughs) it was one of the big it was one of the big ones right i mean there's a handful right correct yeah yeah cisco and oracle and and apple you know yeah i remember at one night i was at apple and um ethernet didn't really exist yet Okay, if you can imagine that. I we, can. <laughs> we had a thing, we had, we had this thing called Apple Talk. And it was like a twisted pair, like kind of serial thing where you can connect computers together and kind of a bus and, you know, it was the beginnings. Great of for a, land parties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, um, <clears throat> and so Apple, you know, had a, had a big LAN and it was kind of, you know, there's Apple Talk repeaters and, you know, it was a campus of like, you know, 10 or 20 buildings across Miriani and, 
VG6 and VG5 and all these different places. And um, one night, uh, one of the software engineers working on Mac OS 7, okay, um, started working on this thing called QuickTime. And we did the first transmission ever of a, a video camera across, you know, the LAN over to another computer. And that was just like this amazing thing, like, because it had never been done before because computers didn't do video because there was too many frames and too many pixels and, it, you know, they were generally too slow. But he had hand-coded this thing, which eventually became QuickTime. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, I used it today. <laughs> <laughs> Several times, as a matter of fact. Um. So how did that kind of pique your interest or how did you move into security from there? Like what, how did that kind of seems like it wouldn't necessarily be congru congruent? Um, yeah, so I, I worked at Apple for a while and then uh, some of the folks I was working with left to uh, go um, start, be a founding team or be a core team at a video game company. Um, and so I left and made a transition from doing hardware and software to kind of more managerial uh, business management, business development, um, because I felt that was um, appropriate for me at my time in my career. And I did some video game stuff for a while, learned a lot um, about business, how to do business, how not to do business. And then um, I went into uh, IC chip design software really kind of what I did, mm -hmm. leveraging some of my background from uh, doing design at Apple. And uh, then I started to get too much spam. So in the early, <laughs> early, early, late 90s and uh, early 2000s, um, the email servers started to get overloaded with spam. And, you know, email, we all, we were kind of tech guys. And so we lived by email. Email was like, you know, life bread, lifeblood thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you used to get 10 or 20 emails a day from your friends and people you're working with. And now all of a sudden you're getting 2,000 pieces of spam. And it just kind of started to become unusable. So I said, okay, um, I, was, I was thinking about this problem, working on this problem, contemplating this problem, and um, looking at a lot of open source software and digging through, you know, how could we wire this together and I was kind of reaching the conclusion that the software was too complicated to sell. People didn't want to buy software anymore. The computers were pretty cheap. They were $1,000, $2,000. The software is like ten dollars or $20,000. We should just include a computer when they buy the software and um, created the concept of, you know, the first appliances. The pizza box. The pizza box that basically <laughs> where the customer was really buying the software. Um, and the box was just, you know, kind of came along for the ride. But it made it a lot easier to design, maintain, upgrade the software. And yeah. then we connected it to the cloud, and, you know, then it became even more powerful. But they, um, that was also useful for the businesses because now they can depreciate it as well as opposed to software, which it's a little harder, you know? Yeah, my accounting expertise in depreciation is, is, <laughs> is not high. I'm familiar with the concept. My accounting, my accounting team and my CFOs, you know, talk about you it. You have people for that. I got it. Yeah, and I'm just, and I'm like, okay, like, but it's not real money, guys. We don't have that money in the bank. We're not going to get that money in the bank. That money's gone, okay? So it's not really here. So uh, why are we counting it again? <laughs> Oh, taxes. Yeah. That's why. Yeah, if you gotta, <laughs> you've got to readjust your earnings. We're, uh, we're taking earnings from next quarter and <laughs> putting it in this quarter. Oof. Um, so, okay. My, my little kind of aside about the spam thing. This is around the same time, actually. Um, I used to have this old email account, and I posted on these old hacker forums and, and uh, message boards or whatever, just you know, talking about random hacking stuff, but those message boards are all very heavily indexed, like really, really well indexed. They're very early on the internet and people try to make them very um, crawlable and mm -hmm. also the news groups, super crawlable. You know, they kind of mirrored, yeah. mirrored on websites. And so therefore I got just an absolute insane amount of email. I had like one of the very first extremely public email uh, addresses like extremely public. Yeah. I mean? So at, at somewhere in there, and I don't remember when it was, um, the spam kings and the spammers 
built crawlers to go crawl all of that, collect mm-hmm. the email addresses so that they could send you the ads for, you know, basically uh, bonus cash or Viagra was the big thing that mm-hmm. I think it really started in. Yeah. Um, and, but, uh, you know, and they just needed email addresses. So, so send the, them to everybody. So, so the, the punchline of that story is my ISP realized how much spam I was getting because it was starting to bog down the server my email address alone was starting to bog down the entire server for all users. That's how much spam I was getting. And so they started working with a bunch of AV vendors and said, Hey, we have this one account in particular, but we have a bunch of accounts that are getting spam, but this one is just crazy. It's just insane. So they started like putting various different appliances in line in my network or, or, you know, it might've been an, in front of appliance. the exchange server or yeah, the email server. I, I, yeah. yeah. I don't think it was exchange. This is, I think this is something else, but whatever it was. <clears throat> and, uh, and I, I could always tell when it failed because like I'd be going along, I'd get like three pieces of mail a day or 10 or something, you know, some normal amount. And all of a sudden I get like 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> like, holy crap. And it would, it would take, I would just have to hold the D key down, like delete. Cause I, I mean, whatever is in there, I don't, I'm never going to find the, whatever yeah. emails are valid. Just, but there was no way to like just delete it all, you know, back then. Select all and delete. Yeah, it was it's, missing. You yeah. know, just like put it like something heavy on the D key, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just got to hold it down. <laughs> yeah. That was like the uh, ultimate problem that actually propelled Barracuda to um, success was everyone's email server was, was dying. Like they were overloaded. And, you know, in your particular case, it was one account overloading the email server. But, you know, progressed a little further, you know, companies would have 100 or 1,000 and they had, they had built the infrastructure to handle that 100 or 1,000 users with, you know, 50 or 100 emails a day. And now all of a sudden they're getting 1,000 or 10,000 emails per day. The server just dies. Email stops working. Nobody receives anything. And business, you know, real business would come to a halt. And so that was what, um, you know... How, why Barracuda was I mean, there know, were, there were an even, overnight success. There were even uh, um, denial of service attacks where it just like, I think it was called mail flood and you just intentionally tried to bl- take someone's machine down just by sending them lots and lots mm-hmm. of email. Yeah. So it wasn't just like a accidental thing and just, you know, I, you know, it was sometimes <clears throat> intentional. That's right. Interesting. Um, so, but you guys did more than just, um, just email, st- well, spam, I should say. You, you did many things related to that. You got into other stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Like what were yeah. what were some of the other lines of business? Well, at Barracuda, you know, I started with the the Barracuda spam firewall, spam and virus firewall, and so we we incorporated spam and virus filtering all in one solution, and then it started to get some other features, but they were all around email security. And then with the success of that, um, we used a similar formula and created appliances for other security applications. We created an, an appliance for doing web filtering to, you know, stop you from surfing bad websites and getting viruses from the web. You know, almost every company has some solution for that now. And then um, we did, um, we got into the backup space with another appliance solution. It was very successful. We even did a product that was not so successful, which to this day, I still don't really grasp why it was not successful. Mm. But it was the, um, at the time, if you remember, back in 2005, 10, there was a lot of AOL chat and um, other chat programs, right, where you could transfer files and um, people could chat in between companies. And it was just kind of like a free-for-all. And everybody was using this in, in company. And in particular, you know, Wall Street guys were all using it to trade tips on stocks and actually avoid uh, getting caught. Mm-hmm. Um Anyway, and so we created a, a, a device, a, a, an appliance that would kind of log and track and stop viruses and kind of apply security to those chat programs. But for the life of it, we couldn't get anyone to really buy it. Interesting. <laughs> Maybe it's because they realized that all, suddenly all of their information would be <laughs> suddenly available. Yeah. It was uh, a really cool product. Hard to do, but went nowhere i think it's the same reason mdm really people just don't like it it's like you want something on my phone i don't i don't, yeah, I, don't yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want that <laughs> i of, of all the software i've seen application whitelisting and mdm those are the two that are both great ideas and both just do not do very well um the other one that i think has um 
some people do this, but not as much as I would have expected is um, network access control mm-hmm. where, you know, you connect to the port or the switch and you have to authenticate. That's just clunky. It, that's and more of a, bef- cl- a clunky I, thing. I know, but like, it's pretty good security. No, it's great. It's, <laughs> okay. it's, it's amazing. If you do it right, it's, it really yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you get over maybe call it a hundred or a couple hundred desktops and laptops and people start bringing stuff in and it just, yeah. it just end up being a maintenance nightmare. But I agree. It's very, very cool software. Another one that's never really kind of like yeah. had its day in the sun. I totally agree. I think it, I think it could work. I think if anyone could do, it would be a company like Google or Microsoft where they just say like, here's a, kind of a baseline and then you kind of turn it on and then, you know, we have some alerting console. Hey, do you want to allow this on or whatever? Yeah. Um, that way you don't have to manage it, manage it. So you guys also at some point produced um, RB an RBL uh, revocation blacklist or block list or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. It was called Barracuda. Oh my God. I had block, forgotten block about this or something. Yeah. An RBL. Um, RBL was basically, um, a block list and it was generally an IP block list. And so you would, you would receive an email and um, then you would look on the, you would look at the IP address and the domain name that it was coming from. And you would look those up in the RBL. And if the RBL said they were bad, you would just block the email. Mm-hmm. And um, there was an RBL that was quite famous and quite successful out of the open source community. I don't know if it's still around. It probably is. Um, but it was, it became one of the mainstays, but then we, there were lots of people who did RBLs and then you would add RBLs. Mm -hmm. You would, um, have multiple RBLs. So I'd check in this one, I'd check in that one, check in this one, check in that one. And if you were listed in any of them, then I would block the email. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the data we had from all of the units around the world and, you know, global kind of deployments of, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers, you know, we started collecting data. And so we published an RBL and let anybody and everybody use it. Mm-hmm. So let me tell you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it started. I'll tell you what happened. So um, it's been integrated into things like Pi-hole, for instance. Um, I think there's about 400 different RBLs. I don't know about that one in particular, but, but, yeah. but there's a lot of them now. Um, and as you'd imagine, some are incredibly well produced. You know, uh, Barracuda might be an example of that, where people care. You know, they actually update it and make sure it's good. And yeah, you know, and if somebody contacts and, you and says, "Hey, I got on here by accident," mm-hmm. or you know, "Hey, I sent yeah. some spam, but I'm not going to do it anymore." So, can you take me off your RBL? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole department handling that. Exactly. <laughs> and then there's the guy in the basement. And it's kind of hard just visually to tell which is which. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Internet so, anonymous nature. Right. So people kind of, they kind of take one of three tacks. They either turn it all off, they turn one or two that they really trust on, or they just turn them all on. And so um, at Bit Discovery, we, <laughs> we grabbed all of them and we just said, hey, if you got an if you got something on running an IP address, we'll just go check to make sure you're not on some RBL somewhere. So customers would come to us. They're like, hey, we're on like, you know, 20 of our IPs are on different RBLs. Like, and they're not all the same. They're just different, like they're whatever, right? <laughs> and they're like, but we checked and it doesn't have the thing. It says, we, you know, it says we're sending spam, but that's not a mail server. We, we, we checked this one. It says we have like a Bitcoin mining thing on it, but we're not running a web server, you know, whatever. There's a bunch of false positives. And I'm like, what do you want? What do you want me to do about that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like you're on the RBL list. I'm like, well, how do we get off of it? I'm like, I, how would I know that? You know, it's some run in some guy's basement somewhere. You got to, you got to call him up and, you know, figure it out. Yeah, They're like, yeah. well, what are the ramifications if, if, if we don't do it? I'm like, well, people won't be able to go to that thing anymore sometimes, you know? Yeah. Well, email coming from that thing that you send email, don't send email from won't get through. Right. Well, well so it and shouldn't pi- be a problem. And then anybody, and well, if, if that's indeed the case, uh, but you know, but sometimes they are running real web servers and then Piho will block them because they took over an IP address that was used by a spammer. You know, a lot of spammers use it for a couple seconds and then, or whatever, minutes, hours, whatever, get rid of it. And so the poor schmuck comes along, uses it, not realizing that it's a totally burned idea. Yeah, well, so so what really mostly happens is, um, we, so we had this case all the time where people would would get on the on the on an RBL or some kind of block list, mm-hmm. okay, and they would call us up and they say, well, that's not an email server. We're not sending any email. Da 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 da. da. And then we would 
you know, forward them the 5,000 emails that were coming from that IP <laughs> address. And they would discover that they, they had been hacked and that there was a bot running on there. Mm -hmm. And it was some part of some large botnet that the uh, spam uh, service provider was selling on the internet to people who wanted to sell spam. And they were sending tons of spam. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that is, that is absolutely a real thing that happens. But there's also it was real, actually there's also the it, real thing that happens that it just it just it's not like it's garbage. It probably was true at the time. Oh yeah, there's the timing it. thing. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. it's definitely a time of check versus time of use issue. Yeah. Um, and so what what our response to the customer is is like we're like the news. I'm just telling you that you're on a list. Like what you do with that information. If you choose to ignore it, go ahead. If you think it's a really bad thing that people can't get to your website sometimes if they're using these RBLs, then you might want to get off that RBL. And if you're asking me how to do it, how would I possibly know? It's like <laughs> you gotta call a bunch of dudes, great, you know, neck beards in a basement somewhere, and hope to God they're gonna take you off the list or that they still exist, right? I mean that. Yeah, exactly. You know, who knows? Yeah. So that's funny. Real mess. Um, anyway, so um, eventually you went into kind of emeritus status or went on the board or something. Like, how mm -hmm. how did that all play out? Um. Well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors going on there. Um, but I had been um, working on, so Barracuda had expanded. Okay. And we had grown, we had offices in China and Japan and throughout different countries in Europe and Canada and even Latin America. Um, and I, I, I had flown over on kind of a whim um, to China with like never been there before. I fly in by myself I, I find somebody at PwC, I end up hiring them like on that trip to head up the Barracuda, I mean the Barracuda China office, you know, this is a long time ago when, when China was, you know, still a respectable place to do business. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so we had all these offices and um, I started looking for a security camera system that was cloud-based. So we, you know, we started in 2003. We, we had, we were one of the first adopters of the Salesforce cloud for CRM. Like, you know, um, you know, we, we engaged with um, Benioff like personally to like get this up and running. Um, and so we were, you know, early cloud adopters in 2010, like the cloud is everywhere. You know, like it's, it's dominating um, the universe. And so I'm like, well, we'll get a camera system. I got multiple locations across the world. I want a security camera system as cloud-based so I can just log into the cloud and see my cameras, right? I mean, that seems kind of obvious. And useful. And useful. And, um, and so I scoured the internet for like weeks, okay, trying to find stuff. I bought a bunch of stuff. None of it worked, okay? Nobody had any cloud stuff. They had stuff that you could remotely access, but not true cloud kind of solutions. And I said, oh my God, here's an industry, you know, that's a 50, 60 billion dollar annual sales industry it's in you know half the buildings in the world in some way shape or form and it's going to get cloudified and the industry has no idea like the, the vendors the suppliers the manufacturers still didn't know what the cloud was and so i said oh my god here's an opportunity to build a company that can um uh, be the salesforce to be the first mover in the video surveillance cloud industry <laughs> And so I started kind of uh, initially tried to do it inside of Barracuda, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but I discovered that the sales channel was the wrong sales channel. Um, and so then I said, okay, I got to go outside of Barracuda and do this. And so I kind of put things in place so that I could go and, and chase this even bigger thing. And the rest um, of the board, they gave you the blessing to go off and do it somewhere else? Correct. Interesting. Yeah. Um. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but I think it's also worth talking about IC Manage, um, which is a company, kind of rewinding the tape a little bit, um, you started around the exact same time as you were running Barracuda, right? Yeah, I started um, Barracuda and IC Manage both in 2003, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and IC Manage is um, source code or, or design management, okay, for semiconductor design. So if you're going to design a big chip like NVIDIA, Qualcomm, um, or, you know, Intel or Samsung memory chip, right? There's a massive amount of data that goes into those, you know, 100 million, 200 million transistors. It's a gigantic um, set of data. 
and you'll have literally anywhere from 100 to 500 people working on this project. And so it, it becomes a big problem to manage all that data. And so IC Manage created one of the first tool sets to actually help manage these big projects and all the data in them. And so you can kind of think of it as, it's kind of like GitHub, but you know, for bigger, 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 bigger things, mm -hmm. right? Because the amount of data is significantly larger. Um, and so we started selling that and we've been very successful. Most of the, most of the chips in the world um, are actually built and designed using IC Manage's software to do the design management. That's cool. Like all that stuff in your cell phone, all that stuff in your laptop, et cetera, et cetera. And they, I mean, that seems like they'd be really scared of doing that. So is it non-cloud? Is that a, is that it is, it is, it is a hundred percent on-prem. Yeah, that yes. makes sense. <laughs> none of, none of, none of these uh, suppliers, Apple, <laughs> Intel, you know, um, Samsung, NXP, NVIDIA are willing to put their data in the cloud at this point. Yeah, in time. I was going to say the, the the couple of conversations I've had where I've done pen tests for similar kinds of companies. They're like, absolutely not. Our bits are not leaving here. Like you're doing every, everything on site and <laughs> on our computers. And <laughs> yeah, I think it'll eventually change. Okay, I, I don't think they'll have a choice but to eventually kind of rethink that a little bit. But they're going to be very careful, very methodical, and uh, very thorough. And um, will be one of the last things I think that moves into the cloud. Yeah, I, uh, I've ended. I've actually ended up having to hack companies just to remove their bits out of their environment just a slight amount just so I can do the one test I need to do. And <laughs> they really don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, I did have to break all of this other stuff just to do the one thing I wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> that did not go over well. <clears throat> okay. So, um, around the same time ish, you, um, you started Brevo. No, no, no. Brevo. Um, I mean, uh, when you, when, uh, sorry, when you left, when uh, I left Eli? When you, no. When, no, when I left, when I left uh, Barracuda. Barracuda, that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I started um, uh, Eli in like 2012, 2013. Okay. And then around 2015, 2016, I actually acquired Brevo. Acquired, okay. Sorry. Okay, and so I'm the uh, chairman of Brevo, and um, I gave them a lot of product direction uh, when I acquired them. Um, but the team there now operates pretty independently. Um, they have a really strong partnership with Eagle Eye, but they are the number one cloud access control system. You know, so those key cards or fobs, or when you open your door with your phone, mm -hmm. um, Brevo is, a, is the largest provider of the cloud solution globally um, for that kind of access control. And they've done really well. Um, and there's a lot of synergy between access control and video surveillance. Okay. So people want to know who so, goes in the door and that kind of thing. So Eagle Eye owns Brevo then, is what you're saying? No. Oh, okay, okay. I own Brevo. You personally own it. Okay, yeah. okay. The, the acquisition part threw me there. Yeah, um, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, people, it's a common confusion point. Yeah, so. usually I think of company acquiring, not a human acquiring, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah, tell us about Eagle Eye. Um, okay, so... When I, I left Barracuda and started working on Eagle Eye to do cloud-based video surveillance. So the idea was, and still is, um, if you can um, transmit all the video to the cloud, store it in the cloud, you get higher reliability, lower cost, all the benefits that we know the cloud brings. And then at the same time, you have the opportunity, because the data is in the cloud, to do AI on it. So you can start to analyze that video. You can start to watch the cameras all the time. You can start to alert people. And so that was the vision. Um, it was pretty rocky uh, from 2012 to 2017. Um, the industry was, you know, basically not interested in adopting cloud. So I was pounding my head against a concrete wall for a number of years, mm -hmm. trying to sell, trying to promote. But you, you saw, you saw a vision. You knew where that was going. Yeah, it, it was inevitable. It was just a question of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And um, being too early. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you know, it's not, not not the worst. You know, it costs you a little bit of time, but then when it's there, you're the leader and you're out in front. So yeah. that's nice. Um, and then um, the AI started to become real. Uh, I'd say about two years ago, um, 
we started to be able to use GPUs and actually analyze video and, and find people in video and find things in the video that were interesting and determine what's a car and do license plate recognition. And so a lot of functionality that, that people really appreciate in a security kind of um, environment, mm -hmm. right? And so that's um, changed kind of uh, the view because the customers are now coming and saying, oh, I want that AI on my video cameras because video cameras normally aren't watched, right? Security cameras just record footage. And then, you know, 99% of the time, you know, people go back and look at the video when something went wrong and say, oh, who did it? When did it happen? How did they, how did they do that? And well, let's go and try and find them and, you know, stop them from doing that ever again kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But now with AI and the video in the cloud, we can start to actually look at all the cameras all the time for people falling down or smoke or fire. Okay. Or, you know, cars, people in a, in an area, you know, between midnight and 6am that shouldn't be there because they're probably trying to steal something. Um, or people going into dangerous areas, you know, many, many, many kinds of things that you can actually automatically kind of uh, use the cameras to watch for and then alert and then respond. It also occurred to me, you might be able to have cameras near entrances or something just to see a count of who's coming in and who's going out. So for, let's say, fire codes or whatever, you'd be able to say mm, the maximum limit of people in this event in this venue should be 200, let's say. And you see 201 go in and it's like, okay, you might want to send somebody down there to yeah. block that entrance. Um, that's a good application. We've seen some customers do that. Most of the people counting is um, in retail though. Mm -hmm. They want to know how many people are coming in the store, when they're coming, that kind of thing. And, you know, they get some of that data, but the video gives them uh, even more perspective on that data, a little more accurate. And then they correspond, uh, correlate it to the... Uh, cash register receipts or the point of sale system so they can see wow we had a lot of people come in but nobody bought anything or wow you know only a few people came in but we all every one of them bought you know and they can compare stores and and do things yeah you might be able to do other things like see like heat map wise where they walk around the store and then figure out well people who purchase go down this aisle people who don't purchase go down <laughs> this aisle like we need, we need to get rid of that aisle or change that aisle or whatever exactly exactly so the heat map they they figure out how to position you know sales the sale signs and different materials into the hot spots that they want to promote the product and they can also see like people that. looking at stuff like people spend a lot of time looking at that display but not the one we really want them to look at so let's yeah. get rid of that one so their eyes go to this one or move this one over yeah. we yeah we call that loiter time or linger time mm -hmm. so yeah i think you could do the same thing with cars right so you can see cars and parking lots um, and get a, count, a rough count of how many people are coming and going to certain venues or whatever without necessarily knowing who they are or breaking their personal privacy per se. Correct. Like, I, I don't know if you know, um, some of the airports um, now have little green lights and red lights over the parking spaces. Mm -hmm. That's mostly done with some cameras and some, some simple AI to tell you what's available. Interesting. That certainly would keep your cost down. <clears throat> you don't have to build uh, sensors underneath all the cars or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then the, um, but where the, where the cameras are mostly coming into play in the parking lots is at the entrance and exit. Um, and so you can scan the license plates and then the, the customer or the, you know, resident or whatever can be automatically admitted so that they don't have to have a gate opener or, or whatnot. That's so nice. That's, and then, that's a really nice feature. <laughs> and then you might also, you can tie it. There's a whole bunch of companies that have kind of come uh, to fruition recently who um, can tie it to a credit card. Okay. And so you have an account, so to speak. And then, you know, you drive in and you drive out and they just charge your credit card. And you don't have to deal with the ticket. And you don't have to deal with the machine. Okay. It's kind of like, you know, the new age way of, of paying for parking. It just, mm -hmm. you know, shows up on your, on your credit card being, and you don't have to worry about it. That's, that is very nice. So are you allowed to start aggregating this uh, information or can your set customer sell you their information for, because I could <laughs> imagine a hedge fund going, oof, that is super interesting to see how many you know, spaces are being used in these retails or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are, our position today at Eagle Eye is that the, the data, okay, is owned by the customers. Okay. Our customers own their data. Um, and we have 
rights to use it for AI training, uh, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we're not trying to um, aggregate data or be a data sale kind of company in any way, shape or form. I, mean, I, mean, and I don't think we're really going <clears> to <throat> change that uh, position. To be, to be clear, I didn't think you were currently selling it, but more if I'm in the, if I'm in the, if I'm Sears or Kmart or whatever, you know, some random company, some retailer, <clears throat> those are terrible examples. Cause I think yeah, those are, those are both going on. I think <laughs> <laughs> you might as well put JC Penny on that list. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Let's go with target. Uh, there you go. Target. <laughs> the one that actually exists. Barely. I don't, know how, I don't know how well they're doing, <clears throat> but um, sure. Let's say target wants to sell their data. It's like, well, we'll, we'll give you like a you know 50% discount because there's all these hedge funds who just love the data. You yeah. Know I mean? That would definitely be a possibility uh, down the road, um, but not something we're trying to do right now. Sure. Right now we just got to get, you know, all of this stuff working mm -hmm. and, you know, and deployed and it's a long process, right? It'll be, you know, probably 10 years before the, the data will be there in aggregate that you're going to be kind of able to go sell it to someone that you'll have enough of a spread, et cetera, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. five years, but it's going to be a little while. So out of curiosity, your personal take on this, I mean, I realize you're very much incentivized to have this company work for you, but are you worried at all about the surveillance state um, where everything is monitored at all times? Um, well, so... <laughs> I'll make a little joke for you. Okay. You know, so I'm worried about the surveillance state, which is why I got into the business so that I could be that surveillance state. I see. Ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm personally, you know, I, I don't really like the idea of the surveillance state of people knowing where I'm going and where I'm at. I'm a little nervous about even Google maps, knowing where I'm going and you know, which houses I go to. It seems a little, a little scary to me to, for someone to have be able to piece that together. Um, that said, um, security cameras um, are here to stay. They're not going away, and they're going to and constantly they're, expand. Yeah, they're proliferating. Proliferating, you know. And we have a we have um, um, violence in society in in many forms, um, which we we don't need to go into. But the answer is often. Um, let's put up more security cameras, okay, when something happens, because no one complains about that. If you want to put a fence around it or you want to shut it down or you want armed security guards, okay, people get, you know, concerned about things, okay? Um, those are all, like, got a little bit of controversy. Maybe not a lot, but, but some. Security cameras seem to have zero controversy when, when somebody says, you know, oh, you know, something bad happened on our, you know, campus, and, um, you know, so we're going to put up another 200 security cameras. Everyone's like, okay, right? No one even blats an eye. If somebody says, oh, something bad happened on campus, so we're going to hire 20 armed security guards and put them at each of the entrances, everyone's like, oh, you know, there's a little bit of nervousness about that, right? Sure. So, um, so I think security, there's about 1 billion security cameras in the world today, roughly speaking. Um, but I think it's going to grow to be, you know, 2 billion, 3 billion 10 billion, there'll be more security cameras in the world at some point than there are people. Okay. Think about that. Yeah. That's, <clears throat> I mean, if you go to London, it's, it's already kind of that way. And yeah. To some degree, you know, and people are putting them on their houses, putting people are putting them every retail, every operate, you know, every campus everywhere. I mean, they're in people's homes all over the place as well. Mm -hmm. just, maybe they don't realize that, but they're all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always a little freaked out by the movies where, um, you know, they, they hack in and take over the TV set and, the uh, you know, the computer and turn on all the cameras and watch everyone in the house. Yep. Always makes me a little, weirds me out a little. Uh, <clears throat> one of the exploits that Jeremiah Grossman and I came up with, uh, clickjacking allowed you to, uh, force people to click on the, uh, to enable camera and microphone so we could watch you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I too, I'm very worried about it cause I helped build one of those. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> it's yeah. bad. Yeah. So how do you go about um, in this AI training model and identifying that something is or isn't a thing? Like what's your process? Is it, is it mostly manual? Like how do you, how do you vet it? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's mostly manual uh, to be honest. There's some automated generation of, of training data, but um, or synthetic data, they call it mm -hmm. um, to kind of, um, speaks things yeah, along splat uh, a person in the image and say that 
is that a person or not kind of thing? Yeah, no, it's usually you take a valid image and, and then you distort it a little bit. Like you may gray out the background or you might, or you know, change some of the colors around or, you know, do some, some minor things like that. If you trade a truly synthetic image and flip it, yeah, flip it, you know, things like that. Truly synthetic images, you know, have some, uh, downsides and, and issues in the training, but the, the, the training data is actually kind of a big issue in the video surveillance world. Um, because getting the training data is um, a challenge for uh, most of the folks in the industry. We have access to it um, and, you know, we keep it all anonymized and we do um, training data and then, you know, we get rid of it, etc. cetera. Um, but that's because all of our video comes up to the cloud. So we can kind of do that. Most other players in the industry, in fact, nearly all of the other players in the industry fail to move any significant amount of the video to the cloud. They just decided that that was too hard and they keep the video on premise. It's kind of like the old school uh, Microsoft Exchange server that used to be on premise. Right. And so that's still the majority of the video surveillance business is all what we call on-prem. Anyway, and so... so they, does that give you like a massive advantage for AI it does. in particular? It does. And so we have a huge training team that, you know, categorizes stuff and looks for stuff, marks stuff, and then we build up a big training database, and then we can continue to refine the AI models. Do, do, you, do you guys also, also offer kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, but like your version of an MSSP where you actually monitor it for people? You actually have human beings? Um, we do not. <clears throat> um, we partner with hundreds of companies that do do that, though. Mm -hmm. You know, So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of resellers across the U.S., Japan, Europe, can they Latin help America. you with training? Can they say that's a person, not a person? Hot dog, not hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, I love that series. That's hilarious. <laughs> Just cracked me up. The first, um, the first episode of Silicon Valley, I, I had such bad anxiety. I'm like, I don't know if I can watch this. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a comedy, but oh. <laughs> what, was, what was fascinating to me about that series, okay, was I, I didn't watch it until like 10 years after it had come out. Or mm. a very long time and i'm just like oh you know it's gonna be stupid you know it's gonna like you know they're not gonna get it it doesn't it's not gonna make any sense like so anyway so i watched like um you know two or three or four episodes and you know i spent 30 years 25 years living in silicon valley and operating there and i still operate there a tremendous amount and like I could not believe how accurately yep. they portrayed the reality of Silicon yep. Valley. <laughs> it was like, oh my God, that happened to me like last week. And it was just all oh. and the you know, it was a little bit exaggerated. Sure. You yeah, know, for, it's gotta be a comedy. Right? But oh my God, the personalities, everything in it was just oh so spot on okay i was just you know for the first four or five seasons i was just cracking up and just going oh my god i can't believe they got that so anyway there's only we digress a, there's only a handful of uh, tv shows that i'm like i can't believe they were able to make this and that was one of them like yeah i don't know how they got the info yeah right like, or, it's and, unreal and a lot of the people were willing to be on the show it's like yes how <laughs> how did you do that yeah. power producers hear that chris you guys have magic Mm -hmm. yes i'm aware <laughs> so um so back to the the training data so <clears throat> do your partners do the hot dog not hot dog uh, they do some of that um but mostly um we do um the training data ourselves mm. right um there is we do have systems to get some feedback and some training and we even are doing some custom models for customers who want very specific things that they want to be able to detect um, that's not a, a big thing for us yet, but we think that it could be, you know, significant in the longer so run. So the only reason I say that it might be better to have a, a much bigger team as opposed to, you know, many partners doing this as opposed to just a small, uh, team. And I don't know how small you are, but smaller anyway than, than all Correct. this. Is. <clears throat> but, um, is the false negative problem because if you're only training on data, you know, is true you might miss a lot of the... Like, no, 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 no. You, 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 you can't just train on true. You got to train as much on negative as you do on positive. Yeah, yeah, but um, like there's somebody in this thing that they just didn't even notice. You know, they they, they didn't... Your team didn't press the hot dog, not a hot dog button when they could have. <clears throat> um, yeah, so you have some bad data. Yeah. Yeah, so the doing kind of, um, 
you know, categorization um, or, you know, data analysis, labeling is what we kind of refer to it as, um, requires like a lot of attention to detail. Like, and so you can't have people doing it who are just kind of sloppy and like just trying to do it as a, you know, give me my $8 an hour and, you know, I'll click the stuff. You actually really got to kind of have people who care and are really attentive to detail. And then you actually have to do a QC check. I was going to say, have somebody else kind of double check, kind of double check it. And then, you know, you look for, you know, some automation stuff as well to kind of, to check it and managing all the data and um, tracking it, labeling it, and then figuring out how to train it. The, the data management problem is actually significant. Um, you, it's not as, as small as, you know, it becomes, you know, everyone thinks it's all about the algorithm, the algorithm, the algorithm, or, you know, how are you going to do your, you know, what's the layers in your model and all that kind of stuff. And that stuff's important, but the team doing that is like three or four people. Okay, and the team doing the labeling like and the data management is like hundreds. <laughs> it's like the stochastic gradient descent stuff. I mean, it's it's more or less. This, it might you might have slight variations on it, or have another layer of a of a um, another node on top of your node doing another transform or something. But correct. <clears throat> the real, I think, what you're getting at is the real magic is having really good training data, really yeah. solid. Yeah. yeah. Well, you also need some smart people to, you know, figure out how to glue the models together and which models to start with and how to get them to run efficiently. Mm -hmm. So the real, the real challenge is, you know, how do you get a model to, in our world, is, you know, we're trying to run AI on millions of cameras, okay? And so you can just kind of think about the compute load that that creates. And to be clear, you don't mean the cameras. You mean in the cloud, right? In the cloud, yeah. yeah. On the data coming from millions of right. cameras. And so the compute load can get, you know, tremendous. And so you have to be smart and efficient in how you do it. You can't just kind of, you know, throw a GPU at Is each that, camera. Do you, uh, do you do it on diffs or something? Like if you don't see, if you see a big enough uh, change in the... There's, there's all kinds of things that we do. Um, you know, one of them is, is, you know, obviously if, if the frame is exactly the same as a previous frame, we don't need to rerun the AI. Or, or approximately the same, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Within, I remember uh, at eBay we d developed something that it sounds kind of similar. It would take one frame and it would invert the colors and it would overlay it on top of the, you know, basically sum up the two. Yeah, so you get a diff. You get a diff and yeah. the, the diff... If it's basically all just perfectly gray, um, then you know nothing changed without actually knowing anything about what's underneath, what, knowing anything about it. And so if if only a handful of pixels have changed to something other than perfectly gray, you're like, nah, that, not enough of this has changed to right. warrant. Our technique is quite a bit different than that, mm -hmm. but same concept. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I think it was called VizDiff. Um, <laughs> it was actually a pretty cool technology. Mm -hmm. Um so you kind of mentioned the the size of this data. Um, what's it like dealing with millions of cameras worth of data? I mean, that's uh, that's not an, it's not like millions of email. It's a it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, I mean, we did a calculation a couple of years ago and and calculated that we we upload to the cloud, you know, a, a hundred or a thousand times more video than uh, is uploaded to YouTube. Okay, because it's just, you know, crazy amounts of video coming up. Um, and so bandwidth is a big issue and then distributing that data among our servers and in the cloud. And our cloud, because it's a video, um, is not built on Amazon or Azure or Google. We actually own and operate our own cloud service um, that was specifically designed for video. Um, we tried doing some implementations early on in you know the Amazon and Azure worlds, and we the, the video just overwhelmed it. Um, it wasn't really set up. It was are set up for general compute, not so much for video. Are you out of curiosity? Are you using your own data center for this, or are you using existing data centers and spreading it out? We use co-location facilities. You know, kind of uh, yeah. old school model. If you remember in the yeah. you know two thousands, where you you rented big cages, and you know now we rent halves of buildings, not quite cages, mm -hmm. but you know. It's grown um, to that level. But yeah, we're not in the real estate business yet. Gotcha. <laughs> yet. <laughs> like I said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, I get it. I'm, I'm sure there's some for sale. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if you look at, um, I, you know, I, I remember Google from the, from the old days, right? You know, Google started in co-location facilities and they kept growing and growing and growing. And then eventually they built their own data centers just yeah. like Amazon did. And just became know, cost others. efficient to do it. Correct. Yeah. And also then they could get rid of uh, one of the, the coolest things I think Google did was they just got rid of the hardware chassis itself and they just, all they had was rails and the motherboard and fans and, yeah. and big fans, not little fans. So it was more, <laughs> more efficient and then caught hot, cold aisles and they, they were, they were pretty innovative. Yeah. I just remember um, going uh, into a data center um, in the early days of Google 2005 or something and there was all these 10 by 10 cages because that was kind of one of the standard sizes. And in the middle of each cage was just one rack, okay? And, you know, so it was, it was like, it was very sparse, right? So you got these 10 by 10 cages, one rack. You know, normally people would put 10 or 15 racks into that cage or something. But um, they were power constrained because uh, Google was so efficient in getting so many servers into that one rack um, that it used all the power of like 10 regular racks. And so that's all they could put there because that was all the power that was available. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's cool. I mean, I've run into similar power issues in singular racks as well. You know, it's like, well, we can only this we can only put about two-thirds of the rack in here, but, and that's with double the amount of power that we're normally allotted. And we're at 80% power uh, budget and anything above that, the fire marshal will come. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. so we have to put it in another cage. Yeah. So the constraint, even for us, um, is far uh, less space than it is power. It's power, getting the power there, power that's available in the building, power, power, power. It's not so much the space of racks and stuff, no. the limiting factor. Interesting. Yeah, well, you can own a power company too while you're at it. <laughs> so, um, all right, let's talk about Draco Motors. Uh, this is this that's is a, that's a non sequitur. This, but, it, right. the, but it's cool. Uh, it's actually one of the coolest things I, I think you're working on, and you're working on some cool stuff. Um, so, when I first heard about this before we talked, um, mm -hmm. I just knew it as the 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 manufacturer of the Draco Dragon or the um, or was about to release the Draco Dragon. Yeah. So just for those who, who have never heard of this, um, because it didn't get that much publicity, even though it is probably one of the coolest cars I've ever seen, a uh, 2,000 horsepower quad motor, all electric SUV, uh, has gold wings, which is interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear why, why he chose that. Zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds. So this is like as fast or faster than the fastest Tesla, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, goes more than 200 miles per hour. Correct, yeah. Um, has a towing capacity of 3,000 pounds um, and a meager list price of 290,000. <laughs> Base, obviously. Yeah. Um, tell me about this. What What's going on? Oh, Okay, so um, about 10, 11, I don't know, years ago, um, it became relatively apparent to me that the electric car was going to start to dominate um, the, the world, right? Tesla, Tesla, I think, had been created but hadn't really shipped anything yet. But I grew up um, in Detroit in the midst of the automotive business. And in fact, um, my summer job was uh, doing electronic design work for Ford Motor Company and General Motors and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I, the, the hard part of a uh, automobile, okay, is the gasoline engine, okay? The gasoline engine is one of the greatest inventions um, that man has ever made. Okay. And if you kind of look at it, it's, it, it was invented in, you know, late 1800s. Okay. And it has had more engineering development done on it than I think any other device or product in the history of mankind. Okay. For 120 years, we've had, you know, 10, 20, 50 major companies spending 
hundreds of millions of dollars a year, every year, making it better and better and better. There's more R&D than has gone into it in dollars than I think any other product in the world. And there's a reason for that in that it's, it's really hard, okay? In order to develop a gasoline engine, okay, and make it reliable and make it robust, there's, you know, 50 different kinds of steel in it. The precision is crazy. And um, it takes about seven to 10 years from start to finish, okay, to develop a gasoline engine. And it's the real barrier to entry to getting into the automotive business, okay? You know, so if you look at automotive makers who kind of start or try and get into the business in a small way, okay, they all buy their engines from one of the majors because they can't do the R&D to achieve it. And so that's the big barrier to entry. But if you switch to an electric car, okay, the great thing about an electric car is you're not exploding anything, right? And electric motors... Hopefully. Yeah, electric motors, <laughs> electric motors have been built for many, 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 many years, okay? They're simple, super simple, okay? Wind some copper around a rotor, you know, hook some electricity to it, we can get them a lot more complicated and, and they will get a lot more complicated as we progress to get the efficiency and performance higher. But fundamentally, they're quite simple. Like, you know, the number of parts in a gasoline engine, I don't know, but, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, thousands. The number of parts in an electric motor, you know, you, you might be in dozens, okay? I mean, this the order of magnitude of engineering and complexity it needs to go to make electric motor just vastly different. And so if you look at that, you go, oh my God, this is, you know, if we can just figure out how to store a little energy in a battery, okay, we can make this all happen and it'll be so much simpler, so much more reliable, so much better, not pollute. You know, it's just, it was very obvious that the electric car was going to be um, the, the new thing in replace, okay? But at the same time, I was, I'm, you know, I do some race car driving. Well, race car driving would be a little bit of an exaggeration. I do some, you know, track driving and, and um, I'm enthusiastic about, you know, uh, car driving. And one of the things you're always trying to do with a car is um, get better handling, performance and handling, okay? And um, so we, my partner and I had this concept and, and started thinking about, well, if we have an electric car, we can put one motor on each wheel, okay? We can make a four-motor car, and with software, we could individually control each wheel and actually apply power to help steer the car and keep this car going faster, longer, better, tighter turns. Just We could do all kinds of crazy things. Now, the software is going to be a real, real challenge, okay? Because it's all going to be in real time, and it's going to be really hard to do. But in the end, everybody's going to want this, right? Because it's going to handle amazing. It's going to be safer. It's going to be better. So we started this project with this really crazy long-term vision of saying, okay, let's go build the software for a four-motor electric car. So we started building it. Um, we tied up with some uh, folks who actually had a similar idea in the university world. Um, and we, we kept doing this. We eventually went to uh, the Nürburgring and broke, the record for an electric car on the Nürburgring um, with a kind of prototype kind of hobby car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we said, okay, well, to go to the next level of testing this or, you know, really doing this, um, we've got to kind of build a car because there's no four motor car we can convert. So we, we got to make a car. So we created the Draco GTE, okay, um, which was a 1,200 horsepower four motor electric car. Um, more of a um, more of a sedan kind of thing, but sports sedan, I guess I'd, how I'd characterize it. So it looks really nice. Um, and then some people approached us and said, oh, can we buy one? And we said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we kind of more accidentally ended up in what I'll characterize as the boutique car business. Sure. Um, and the real mission was actually all about software. And so along the way, um, we developed some really amazing algorithms. We tested cars for, you know, just crazy amounts of hours on tracks in order to tune the algorithms. Because, you know, if you're going around a, a corner, right, based on your speed and on how fast you're turning, the outside wheels need to go a little faster than the inside wheels. Sure. And so 
Um, the way a normal car handles that is it uses a mechanical differential, but we won't go into that. But the outside wheels, if you put a little more force on them, okay, can help bring the car around and avoid understeer and oversteer. Okay, but getting that perfect algorithm, okay, on different speeds, on different types of surfaces, and on um, different radiuses of turns, etc., cetera, and, uh, is, you know, crazy hard. Like, how do you go figure that all out? What kind of math? Okay, how do you get algorithms to do it? Then and you, you go you and say... You have to worry about weather too, right? Well, yeah, I was just kidding that. <laughs> right? So then we take it, we take it up and we, we went ice driving in Finland and working on, you know, how do you get the same algorithms to work on ice? Um, and then snow and slush and rain and wet and, you know, all these kinds of things. I mean, these driving courses that the big automotive, <coughs> automotive companies have, I mean, they're crazy. They'll be like going over uneven side or one side will be an ice, the other side won't and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, but in the end, the, the real testing happens on the road or the track, right? And so um, you can kind of do little things like that. But in the end, you got to get it on the, you got to test it at speed, right? Mm -hmm. And you can only do that. Um, in real road conditions or real track conditions. So um, anyway, so we developed the software and then the challenging part about it was the software needs to be very real time. Okay. So if a wheel starts to slip or needs a little extra oomph to do the right thing, you've got to respond in milliseconds. Okay. We try and you know, kind of keep things in a roughly a five millisecond kind of response time. Well, your existing operating systems, Linux and Windows, can't do that, okay? Because the kernel can get an interrupt and, you know, something could happen and then something else happens and then, you know, it's 40 or 50 milliseconds before you respond. And by then, you know, you're maybe off the road. <laughs> Not quite, but, you know, it's too late. You, you have to have real-time response. And those operating systems were built. So we found ourselves kind of working really hard in, you know, how do we do like a small, simple operating system? And so we ended up kind of getting into that zone as well in order to achieve the performance goals that we were trying to do. Kind of crazy. So anyway, huge software project is what it's turned into. So, okay. Tell me, is this thing, the software, is it going to be along the lines of, um, of a Linux where you can port it and use it in multiple different places? Or is this like super custom or what? You know, we're, we're quite open um, to um, sharing it, licensing it, you know, working with others to provide it. If you think about the, the software problem in the automotive industry is pretty severe right now. Okay, and you can see some YouTube videos from the folks at Ford and and um, Audi and um, VW where they, they, they actually honestly tell you about their, their software woes. Um, and the problem is, is that, you know, if you go back five years ago, if you go back, if you go back, you know, to like the 50s and 60s and maybe even the 70s, there was no software in a car. Okay, in the 80s, 90s, you know, 2000s, we started to get a lot of software in the car. But the software came in these little boxes that the auto manufacturer bought from a supplier and they screwed in and, and wired in. And the auto manufacturer never saw the software, okay? They don't know what's in it. They don't know how it was created. They have no knowledge. And so then over time, they ended, these, these are called ECUs, okay? Electronic control, control units. units. Yeah. yeah because they originally started with just transistors, but then, you know, they got CPUs and software in them, but they never changed the name. It's kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so now, you know, your car has, you know, 10, 100 of these ECUs in it, but they all have a different operating system. They have a different software stack. They come from different suppliers and they have no way to be upgraded over the air. You have no way to revise them. You have no, like, they have no control over it. So they have to move from this world where they literally have a, a hundred little boxes that are being provided and they've got to now kind of take control of the software because the software be has become such an important part of the car that they can no longer just ignore it. They have to take control of it. Otherwise, they're going to get, you know, pushed out of the business in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. 
just like they have to take control of making, you know, the electric motors and stuff, right? Anyway, so it's a fascinating kind of industry, industry evolution, right? And at the same time, just to make it even harder for the automakers, okay, they have to kind of start figuring out a self-driving strategy. Right. Okay, with GPUs and, you know, all this kind of serious ADAS, you know, driver assist stuff to basically deliver the cars that, you know, people are going to expect. And, you know, that's a huge AI software challenge, okay? We're not tackling the self-driving piece um, at Draco Motors. We're going to, you know, there's, there's people spending crazy amounts of money on that. We couldn't really compete with, right. you know, Alphabet. Um, trying to go and make self-driving cars, you know, right. et cetera. Um, but we're doing kind of the, the control layer that, you know, would underlie that. So this kind of gets rid of the traditional software that would live on the CAN bus and you you have preferential treatment to the hardware components to get faster throughput. But what about the non-critical, <coughs> like, you know, the turn signal? I mean, it's still critical, but not millisecond critical. Yeah, the the... The, the, the non-critical thing is, you know, we always we always use the entertainment system as the example sure. for the non-critical kind Actually, of component. Actually, I don't know. Would, 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 uh, would you consider the wipers or the or the turn signals? Is that critical? I, you know, it's semi-critical. You know, you got to have... Semi-critical. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, braking is critical. You braking know, is Throttle critical. control <laughs> is critical. Unless it's raining, yeah. you know, wipers <laughs> are help. Yeah. Yeah, but, but millisecond, I don't know if it's that critical. Yeah. Um, uh um, uh, battery um, management, mm -hmm. okay, charging, pretty critical. You know, if you overcharge or discharge or mess that up, um, you know, things can explode. Not good. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, um, you know, engine control, you know, motor control is um, super critical. ABS, super critical. Um, and then all of the ADAS stuff, you know, the radar that stops the car, the self-driving components, um, you know, the backup beeper thing that doesn't let you back up and you know all of those things where you're actually trying to stop accidents from happening right. are all very timing critical uh, driver assist absolutely yeah um so but what do you do with this the non-critical stuff so, so you mentioned the entertainment system as an example um so in the in the in the draco drive os okay we partition stuff into critical and non-critical okay and the critical stuff gets critical treatment okay so it's it's a it's a multi-priority kind of operating system, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. And then the non-critical stuff, you know, is mostly put into a bucket um, of non-critical stuff of, <laughs> of get to it when you can. Yeah. yeah. And it's pretty complicated because the in, in today's world, the majority of um, time critical stuff, we'll call it, we call it real time kind of stuff, is generally done on a single CPU, a single CPU with a single CPU core. Because it's not as straightforward. If I do one task and I have one CPU, okay, I can write the software and I can test the software and then I can know that the software is going to respond. Okay, pretty straightforward. If I go and say now, ooh, I got eight CPU cores, okay, and I'm trying to manage all of this stuff that needs to be real time, I, my number of variables goes way up, mm -hmm. right? The complexity goes way up. And so that's what we've tackled. And, you know, we have a, we have a, something we think is a solution to it. So it seems like all of these projects have like a little bit of an AI component buried in there. Maybe not directly, mm -hmm. but maybe it's sort of indirect, but it's sort of, it well, seems like it's touching everything you're working on at some level. I think, I, you know, in all honesty, I think any software company is, is being touched by AI right now, right? I was listening to um, somebody, <laughs> I was, um, I was, uh, um, at a, I don't know what kind of session it was. Somebody was playing for me some um, good and bad videos of people on TV, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, showing how they, you know, I wouldn't say dodged question, but how they answered the question with a different answer than, you know, what it was and how they matched up with, you know, maybe the, the interviewer, um, knows nothing about the topic. I was just asking generic questions and how they respond and whatever. Anyway, um, and so I was watching this uh, video, and I don't know how old it is, okay, because it might be five years old, it might be 10 years old, it might be like last week, I don't know. But it was uh, the CEO of Box 
And he was put up as kind of a good example. And, and apparently the media go to him for commentary on all kinds of things that have nothing to do with box. And, but anyway, he was basically uh, putting in everything in the world about box and AI. Okay. And I'm like, you're like a drive in the cloud. Like, you know, I mean, how much AI can you do? Well, you know, AI to help you write AI, this AI, that, you know? And so I think AI is touching um, almost every and any software company. Um, in the world today, um, you know, it's probably in video games even. Oh, sure, already, already yeah. there in uh, NPCs. Yeah. Um, so. So anyway, so my software companies are all being touched by AI, or all have an AI component. Okay, yes. but 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 is it? Um, to me, there's a lot of hype, um, and I'm kind of curious as somebody who actually uses this in their business, not just theoretically uses it, actually practically uses it. I mean, what is it, where do you, well, first of all, let's talk about the hype and then we'll talk about why it's good. Okay. So what, 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 what's, well, what's going wrong with the AI industry right now? Well, okay. So what is interesting to me, okay, is I think that some industries are going to be highly impacted by AI. Okay. And um, if you think about cars, software and cars and cars going self-driving, right? That has a huge impact on that industry going to fundamentally change the way we drive in cars, the way we experience cars, what they have to manufacture, what they have to build. That industry is going to be turned somewhat upside down on it. In the video surveillance industry, which is Eagle Eye Networks, AI is also going to have a huge impact because we can watch all the cameras all the time, whereas before nobody watched the cameras ever. Okay. I mean, that's really what it is. So it fundamentally changes the product that we're delivering at Eagle Eye Networks. We're no longer going to be delivering a video management system, which is what everyone sold. Okay, we're actually going to deliver an AI security system that's going to watch all the cameras for what the customer cares about and then let them know and try and stop it, sound alarms, you know, send security guards, you know, at some point maybe even send robots, you know, who knows, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, it's going to fundamentally change the product we deliver, just like in the automobile industry. But in other industries, okay, you know, like grocery business, you know, uh, you know, maybe I get stuff on the shelves a little faster. Maybe the stuff I want is a little more towards the front of the store. Maybe the, you know, shop online thing guy, you know, is more, I, you know, I don't know. I like, but there's still going to be groceries and the prices are going to be mostly the same. And, you know, I'll still have an option to have them delivered or not delivered, or I can go to the store and pick them up. Like, it's really not going to change that business a whole lot. It'll change it a little bit. And so when you think about AI and the hype, Okay, you know, you got to kind of tie it a little bit back to, you know, the industry in my mind, right? And if you think about what AI is doing in these industries that are going to be significantly impacted, it's pretty significant. You know, there's cars driving around San Francisco that you can hail on your phone and get in and they'll take you to wherever you want to go, okay, within the city and there's no driver. Okay, that's not hype. That's like real, like crazy. I never would have thought it could have happened this fast. Happened much faster than, you know, I felt would be possible. And it's going kind of similarly in the video surveillance industry with Eagle Eye. You know, we think that we will be pretty good or deployable, okay, in large volume for weapons and gun detection next year. Okay, and so someone brandishing a weapon on any camera will be, you know, flagged and, you know, somebody can be sent to kind of deal with it. Right? How do you how do you build the training corpus for that? <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> Fortunately, part of my team is in Texas. <laughs> and uh and they like guns in Texas. Uh -huh, all right. And so uh yeah, you know, there's, you know, a lot of the, this is an interesting thing. A lot of guys show up on my doorstep trying to sell me AI. Okay, for Eagle Eye Networks. Okay. And so I immediately say, you know, what's your, what's your training corpus? And, you know, they take a guess at what the answer is 90% of the time. Oh, geez. I don't know. Um, for, for video specifically. Yeah. For video. Oh, and maybe just scraping Google images. I don't know. It's YouTube, YouTube, oh. YouTube. We got the videos from YouTube. We got the videos from YouTube. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, YouTube's, at least it was video. I was thinking yeah. it was just static images. Which well, is it is, worse. you know, it is actually, there is that case too. <laughs> <Don't go. laughs> okay. But, but you know, the problem with uh, YouTube 
is, do you know how much surveillance video is on YouTube? Basically none. Basically none. Yeah. Okay. Surveillance video is really boring. Okay. It's crazy boring. It's the same image, like, you know, 24 seven. Okay. And then occasionally, you know, somebody walks through it or a car goes through it or, you know, whatever, but the background is constant. Okay. And so it's just, it's different video than, you know, you get on YouTube. And so, you know, the, the training set is, is, is critical, but it's gotta be the right training set. <laughs> and a lot of people don't, don't understand that. Anyway. Um, so I think that, um, you know, as usual, the stock market, you know, is preceding the universe and valuing AI companies probably pretty well um, because they, you know, see a lot of potential. But, um, you know, you've got to think about the industry. You know, I would argue that, you know, the AI implementation in, you know, I'd go in as far as to say salesforce.com is going to be modest. Okay, you know, can I eliminate some sales guys? Can I make my sales guys go a little faster and sell a little more? Yeah, but how much more? You know, I'm not going to make my sales guys 2x more productive. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just it's not realistic, right? You know, there's just some fundamentals. You know, maybe I can make them 50% more effective, whatever, whatever, you know. But it's not going to fundamentally change the product they deliver, right? Um you know, and the same goes for, you know, maybe AI and advertising, which might be a little closer to home for you, right? You'll get better targeting and, you know, the AI will be a little more in tune to the customer, but, you know, you're still selling advertising, mm -hmm. right? I was, was going to ask, I meant to ask this earlier, uh, are you splitting the stream of data between video and audio? Are you keeping them separate or are you still keeping them all combined into one big stream? Um Good question. They're fundamentally separate streams, uh -huh. you know, because the, the, the video is in a, you know, an MP3, Four. you know, MP4, MP, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm getting my MPs mixed up. <laughs> MP3 is audio. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, so the audio is in an MP3 or an AAIC stream, I think is kind of what it is. And then um, the video is in an H.264 kind of uh, MPEG stream or H.265 MPEG stream. Sure. And there's, th those are bundled together into a, you know, a, a, I don't know, a container effectively. And we manage that container kind of um, holistically. Well, the reason I was saying, because you were mentioning like gunshot detection or uh, gun detection, it could, you mm -hmm. could also have gunshot detection. Correct, and, yeah. Uh, so those, in that case, it would be, we would route to separate places for the AI. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, well, we talked a bit about the hype. Where do you think there's a lot of promise like um i'm gonna i'm gonna video surveillance <laughs> well yeah but I, I mean beyond there though like if you were going to invest in a net new area for ai <coughs> is there uh, anywhere you think is super hot right now you know it's kind of interesting i i don't i kind of stay in my own little universe of cars and video surveillance and semiconductor chips and security and security <laughs> yeah um it's such a small so, world <laughs> yeah you know so it's fun you know you know, it keeps me from, from getting bored in any one, uh -huh. in any one zone, which is always one of my fears in life is that I would, you know, be the guy who was, <laughs> you know, 30 years later doing the same thing I was doing 30 years beforehand. Uh -huh. uh, but wait, aren't you doing the same thing you were doing 30 years ago? Well, you know, you know I, I, I wasn't, I, I uh, maybe <laughs> tech. I mean, if you, if you broadly call it as tech, yeah. Um, but the, the uh, midlife crisis starts now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> like, oh no. So, um, <laughs> you know, so there is there is an interesting um, place. Okay, so that I think is um, got a lot of potential, and you're seeing this now already um, in GitHub's, you know, Copilot or whatnot, yeah. where the AI is actually really helping write code. And like I've actually gone to and written a number of pieces of code using AI. And, you know, it's pretty good. It gets you a good start, like saves you a bunch of time. And so there's productivity kind of stuff that I think is, you know, beneficial. But we did have an incident uh, at, at Eagle Eye where one of our team members um, was using AI to produce his work and not checking it. And it was just garbage and he was you know posting it turning it you know pushing it out and uh we had to fire him i was just like are you kidding me you didn't you know so you know wow fireable offense 
Was it really that bad? Oh, it was horrific. It was horrific. I mean, beyond. Yeah. You know, was it like a blog post or something? Like what, no, no, no. It was. It was worse than that. It, yeah. Uh-huh. I, I don't want to go into it. Okay. 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 But it impacted, uh, you know, all of our customers directly. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. see. I see. Yeah. You know, and so it's just like, okay, you're clearly not here to work. Okay. Or provide a good product and you clearly don't care. So it's like, I'm sorry, we have to okay, well, just move on. Uh, I mean, that's, I think that dovetails in nicely into the, the next little part here. Where do you see people making mistakes or like where, where's the, where's the problem space live? Do you think? Is it, is it training data? Is it people being stupid on the outputs and not double checking it? Is it algorithms? I mean, where, where, where are you most concerned? Where are you seeing the problems these days? I think it's kind of a, personally, I think it's a mix of everything. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's I, a I, lot of problems. I, I can't, like, you know, there's problems, but, you know, we'll come, we'll overcome all those problems in think so? some way, shape, Every or one form. Of them? Well, eventually, you know, I mean, when we made the first transistor, you know, who imagined that we'd be able to make a billion transistors on one chip? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, do you know how many problems had to become over? The problems in that space that we, that we deal with in that industry are nuts, like it's down to the atom level. It's like crazy. I was like, I can't even comprehend it at this point. Like the science and the physics behind it. Um, and yet it keeps going. Right. Like it's crazy. Uh, yeah. Every, every year they say, Oh, it's the death of Moore's law. And the next year, <laughs> like, it's back. It's <laughs> back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the AI front, um, you know, we're, I think we're just in the beginning of it. Um, I kind of worry a little bit about it. Um, you know, spiraling a little out of control, right? And I think the issues... In what, in what way specifically? Well, um, so you're familiar with this. The bad actors will take new technology in ways that, you know, we never thought of. Okay, the guys who created email never envisioned spam, okay? <laughs> the guys who in, created the internet never envisioned that, you know, people would try and hack and sneak in and, you know, build bots that would crawl the net and then take over machines and then send more spam. You know, just like stuff that, you know, the bad actors come up with um, is impressive. Like, I actually had this crazy thing go down to one of my employees. Okay, so he gets a phone call. and I'm not sure I'm going to remember the story completely at 100% here. But he gets a phone call from his son and his son says, hey, dad, you know, I was in this car accident and uh, the woman I hit is, is really hurt and, you know, they're hoping she lives, but we're at the hospital, like, but I'm in jail because uh, the police have me and, you know, um, you know, I need you to wire some money, you know, I'll send you the, the info, uh, lawyer will send you the info, you know, uh, I need like, 40 grand or something wired da, 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 da. and you know, I got to go like, you know, uh, please sir, please say, you know, I gotta go. I gotta go. And he hangs up. Okay. And like, this is his father. Okay. And he's like, Holy cow. I gotta go. Gotta help my kid. Like, you know, gotta come up with some money, you know, call this lawyer. Da, da, da. So he calls the lawyer. The lawyer says, yeah, this is what I got to do. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right. And then, you know, and then he's, he's just like, you know, gets a, 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 a feeling. So he starts doing some homework, trying to figure, look up this lawyer, see if this guy's a real lawyer, you know, gets a little suspicious, you know, eventually calls his son and says, hey, uh, what's going on? Uh, nothing, dad. It's fine. Yeah. What, what's, what, what's up, dad? Uh, you know, <laughs> nothing what's going on. Okay, so complete voice fake, right? And uh, they did, a, you know, and basically the voice was stolen off of, um, I don't know, some Snapchat or YouTube posts of him doing stuff, sure. which is why I should probably not do this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you have a, as long as you have like a special code word for that kind of stuff, you, you should. Well, be- yeah, you need to have a, you need to have a code word for you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. So anyway, so it's, it's, or you need to interrogate questions, right? You know, but you know, so, but it's hard to do that in an emergency. Like oh, I need it right now. Exactly. I need it right now. I gotta go. But, you yeah, know. exactly. Right. Um, so, but like this happened to like 
a guy that like I talk to every day and like he was, you know, he's a tech guy. He's smart. He's management. He's a leader, you know, and yet, you know, he, he almost fell for it. Like, can you imagine somebody who is not as savvy as that? Like, I mean, they're just going to get, they don't have a chance. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I, I think that the challenge or the, the fear or the, the biggest concern with AI is in some ways how it's misused, right? By people who are purposely misusing it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that, you know, we have to, to worry about, right? You know, anyway. I think we've got a lot of problems. That is definitely <laughs> one of them. Absolutely one of them. Um, deep fakes. Uh, I put a challenge out there. No one really took me up on it, but I was uh, put out a challenge about a year ago or so. Just like, please deep fake me as well as you can with a video though, specifically, it's gotta be a video and I'm going to show it to everybody I know who knows me well and say, what do you, what do you think about this? Like, give me feedback on what I said, like pretending like yeah, I did, did say it, it just yeah, to yeah, yeah. see I love if it. I could fool them. Cause if that's the case, then we have fully passed the Turing test. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I'm surprised I think, nobody did that. You yeah. offered money too. I know. I know. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's inevitable. Okay. I think it's inevitable. Um, and you know, people are kind of doing it already with little animation things and you know, where they, they take four or five year images and they'll animate you saying whatever, whatever. And it's like, it's not great, it, you know, but it's actually impressive that it works at all. Right. But you know, evolution or you know people are going to keep making it better and better and better and you know a number of years from now it's you're not going to be able to tell the difference so so i have started using there's a couple of uh apps out there that will like take your you know upload enough photos of yourself and it'll create completely net new photos and i sent uh three that were especially good there's a bunch that were bad uh right. like really bad they I'm like they cannot figure out what uh, ethnicity i am for instance <laughs> I'm either black or Egyptian or some, I don't know what I am. Uh, but anyway, we've, uh, the ones that looked good, I sent uh, to some people who I'm close to and I'm like, hey, uh, any preference on which headshot I should use? And, <laughs> and so again, you know, like giving them the impression that this was real coming from me. So mm -hmm. there's no reason to doubt it. And they're like, oh yeah, I think I like two better. Like they're, and totally like, taken. Totally taken. I'm like, absolutely not real photos. <coughs> and they're like, well, why did you just do this? I don't understand. Well, because like, I wanted to see if you could, you know, <laughs> if you would write back and say, hey, these are not photos. What, what the heck are you doing? These don't look like you or, you know, whatever. <laughs> had to test it. I do have to test it. Um, yeah. Boy, I, I've used my friends and family as guinea pigs an awful lot. I just realized. But <laughs> it's a useful barometer. I'm doing it in a safe way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, um can we talk a little bit about entrepreneurship now? Sure. Um, I think, uh, so when I have these kinds of conversations and it's not very frequent, um, I, I, the, the words Prado distribution just pop into my head. I'm like, there is somebody <laughs> who's doing just freaking everything. Um, like you're one guy and you have all these different businesses going on. Um, which, so as an, as an investor and you know, people, you know, I built companies and whatever, when people say I'm working on this and this and this, I, it's usually an insanely red, big red flag to me. I'm like, oh, that means you're not, you're not focused. Not focused. You're not going to get it done. It's a red flag to me. Yeah. If, as an investor. Yeah, and 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 yet here you are. Yeah. <laughs> mm, you know, um, it's really about um, having the right people, kind of operating and executing, kind of what's going on. So if you look at kind of the Brevo. Um, situation which I acquired you know I guess I'm kind of a I don't know a buyout guy or something in my my own way mm -hmm. um, but you know there was a the management team there that I kept I didn't replace and so um, I just you know I was kind of their coach for you know a few years to kind of get them you know on the right track and and you know now they're flying by themselves and my interaction and a, you know need to be involved is pretty modest you know, in the case of IC Manage, right? Um, you know, we built that up, worked really hard at it for five or 10 years. And, you know, we now have this awesome team in place and, you know, the customers are established and it just keeps kind of going and going and going. And so it takes very little of my, you know, time and energy. Um, Eagle Eye Networks, you know, is, is a full-time gig. And, um, you know, the Draco Motors thing is, you know, more of a development project at this point. And we're, you know, uh, f developing the software, you know, this massive amount of software. 
um, which, you know, I'm not directly involved in, you know, I deal with, you know, how do we, what do we do and why do we do it? Um, but you know, not the day to day, whereas Eagle Eye Networks, I'm involved in the day to day and, and driving everything from, you know, sales strategy and marketing message and, you know, whatnot and which not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I kind of, uh, I, I time, I, I time domain multiplex, you know, so I'm, I'm time focused on Eli right now with a little bit of distraction from Draco Motors. I'm not trying to do six or seven things. Okay. So why entrepreneurship? I mean, if you were going to sell it to somebody, cause it can, it can be amazing and it can be terrible at the same time. So <laughs> why, why, why for you? What's your, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, that's, um, a simple question for me, really. So I really enjoy um, two things, okay? One is problem solving by creating a product that's like a better mousetrap or a better solution, you know? And it doesn't matter what it is. I get interested and enthusiastic about, you know, how to make a better microphone stand and, you know, solve the problem of it keeps falling down and, you know, or... Um, you know, whether it's a, you know, a security camera that can see more at night, you know, and um, whatever the problem is, you know, but I like solving a problem. I don't like inventing things that don't solve a problem, you know, so a good entrepreneur, okay, um, builds a product to solve a problem. The less good entrepreneur has technology that's looking for a problem to solve, Okay. And so there's often you see companies where, you know, they've developed, you know, audio compression technology or audio differential technology, or they've developed, you know, a, a diff for uh, images. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and they're running around trying to find a problem, right? They didn't develop the technology to find a problem. They developed the technology because it was an interesting, you know, research or interesting thing, but there was no, kind of fundamental business problem that they were trying to solve. And so you want to be kind of solving a business problem that has dollars impact. And so I enjoy that piece of it. And then the second piece I really enjoy is, is seeing the customer smile or enthusiasm when they experience it or they use it and they go, Oh my God, this is so much better. Like, Oh my God, this made my life a little, you know, a little more easier, a little, little more reliable, you know, or whatever, whatever the, you know, the solution is doing. Um, so those two things I get, um, you know, what I live, build, try and do, right? Create something that solves a problem and then, you know, get it to people so that they can enjoy it. So that's what motivates me. Yeah. So what about when it fails? I mean, I, I, you haven't had any spectacular failures from what I've seen, but perseverance. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. Perseverance. It's, it's strictly sheer willpower. Okay, you know, so the average company, fortunately not for me, but the average company <laughs> succeeds on business plan 2.5. Right. Okay, so that means you fail once and half of them fail again and then they figure it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I've been luckier than that. Um, but, you know, you, you have to just persevere. Okay, um, and not give up. But you have to like be going after a problem that a customer has and try and solve it. So you may show up and say, Hey, I've got the world's greatest security camera system for, you know, um, X, Y, or Z. And the customer says, well, that's great, but I don't really have that problem. I have this problem. Right. And then you, you might pivot over there and say, Oh, well we can solve that problem. Right. And so, um, a good entrepreneur or a good, kind of startup company, you know, will do that, right? They believe the right way to do it, though, and I hate to say this, okay, um, is you really want to test the product concept before you go build it, okay? That's kind of a key thing to being a successful entrepreneur. You don't go and, like, build it and see if they come, right? Mm -hmm. You see if they come, and then you build it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can. Yeah. So the only place I haven't done that, okay, is Draco Motors, right? Because that was such a long-term kind of view. We couldn't really and go it to... it sounded more passion project than anything, yeah, initially anyway. Exactly. Um, 
And so, you know, I need a 2000 horsepower car. What do you mean? <laughs> 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 Gotta have it. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, the real, it, it was also a, a, another motive in there was to get a, an electric car that we could run on the track. Right. Because all these great electric cars don't do very well on the track. You do one or one or two laps in most electric cars and the battery overheats and then they go into what we call limp mode um, where, you know, you go at 20 miles an hour and then you got to let it cool off for a few hours and then you can do another lap on the track. Um, and so, you know, many objectives in there of, of problems to solve. Interesting. So did you solve that problem? Yeah. 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 That's cool. We have a, um, um, our own battery design in order to achieve that. So that's, that's cool. Um, out of curiosity, <coughs> do you think being a, you, you strike me as a pretty technical guy and other conversations we had, uh, pretty technical, um, like surprisingly in areas I wouldn't necessarily expect you to need to be technical and you were technical in those areas. Do you think that that is an advantage for a CEO to be technical or do you think it's a distraction or, um, where do, where do you fall on that? That that's actually quite an interesting question. Um, so, I obviously, being technical, think it's a huge advantage. Okay, but you know that's the, you know, you're asking you know the wrong person. Not necessarily. I mean, but sometimes it gets in your way too. You know, you must spend yeah, too much time in the weeds. It's true. Um, but you know, if you're going to be in the tech business, okay, if you look at the companies. And this would be an interesting question. You should do a little, little, little kind of s- not survey, but a like a, a study on it. But if you look at the companies that have been truly great, okay, um, the founders have typically been very technical, and they've typically stayed with the company f- and not been removed by the venture capitalists or the investors. Okay, so you look at Apple, you look at. Yahoo. Well, Apple, he, he was removed. I know, but, but then he, <laughs> then he went, I, it, then it cratered and he went back and saved it. So in the end, right. Um, the technical, uh, you know, uh, somewhat technical founder, mm-hmm. right. Cause actually Wozniak was the technical founder. If you think about it. Yeah. Uh, but Steve, um, was very technical. Zuckerberg would be another example. Zuckerberg would be another example. Cisco, I think, um, has, has technical roots. If you look Larry at Larry and Sergey. Yeah, and at Google, etc. So if you look at the companies that have, you know, um, you know, Salesforce.com would be a contradiction, right? Because Benioff's not technical, but he understood the product. He was a product guy, right? So, and so, uh, and heard, so I think the strongest I've places heard, for the the success is actually kind of being technical or being a product person. So I've, I've heard, definitely heard the other version of that, which is. If your company still has uh, the founder in their in the CEO role after the first like four or five years, that's usually a big red flag because usually what it means is they just haven't figured out how to get rid of that guy yet, and they probably should. Yeah, you know, they, they might be a research role or be a strategy or you know hang around on the board, but not a day to day operator. So I would um, I would argue that and and. That's an on average, by the way. I don't think that's an yeah. all the ca- all the time. Zuckerberg would be a good example. Yeah. So I I think that that was, you know, venture capital thinking of twenty years ago. Okay. And I think um, the venture capitalists, you know, it was normal to replace. That was like their formula, right? You know, okay, we got it off the ground. It's proven. Okay, let's get some professional management in here, but. Um, there became a, a new class of venture capitalists that came in and took a different route, which was let's keep the founder in because he's got the vision and he's got the drive. He's not a hired gun. Okay. And so he's not out to maximize his personal paycheck. He's actually out to execute on the vision, which is going to create the most value for us. And the venture business, you know, makes most of its money on the crazy, crazy big home runs right? Not on the little guys that, you know, end up being hundred million or billion dollar companies. They want to get to the 10 billion, $50 billion companies because that's where they really uh, get the return for their, their limited partners, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so they're developed in, I don't remember what year, uh, but probably in, 
in the mid 2000s, this concept of the founder friendly venture capitalists. And so all the venture capitalists kind of started to swing and advertise how they were founder friendly, founder friendly, because the, the founders didn't want to go to these guys who were going to boot them in five years and bring in the professional management team. They're like, you know, this is my vision. I want to execute it. You guys don't know what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, um, and so I think, it's, it, I think it's shifted a little bit. And so the, the strategy is now let's figure out how to help that founder, coach that founder, train that founder, get the right people around that founder, but let them, uh, that founder still kind of drive the ship. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but feel free to disagree. No, I, I, no, I, I don't actually think I do disagree. <laughs> um, but it, I have heard the other, the, the other version yeah. of that. And, um, uh, did you, um, see, I watched, I, just, I was on, on a plane recently and I watched the movie Blackberry. Oh yeah. Oh my God. That was I very was very interesting. I was just floored because it was, it was a little bit like out of the, um, out of the Silicon Valley series. Mm-hmm. Um, but the story was, was just mind boggling. I had no idea that there was that much drama behind uh, I mean, I knew Blackberry. That, I knew that they sank, uh, into oblivion more or less, um, rim now. Yeah. Um, and, um, but the the road to getting there was just so wild. Like, yeah. Anyway. Well, it's funny because I kind of picture Apple in the early days being pretty close to Rim in the early days. Um, you know, kind of, you know, I don't uh, know b- bootstrapped to some degree, just barely kind of figuring it out, and kind of a lot of people, you know, wearing shorts and t-shirts and just kind of. Yeah, Apple was not like that when I was there. Really. Yeah, Apple had grown because Apple had like. I don't know, four or 5,000 employees when I was there. But then it went back. Th- it went, <laughs> so it started off in shorts and t-shirts and it's now back there. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was always shorts and t-shirts, but you know, it was, there was, there was corporate culture, there was politics, you know, okay. there was, you know, but they were serious about making great products and um, it wasn't like seat of the pants, anything. Mm-hmm. So, remember and certainly that, isn't now. I remember that uh, famous scene where, uh, uh, Jobs put the iPhone in the water tank and a bunch of bubbles came out of it. And then he's like, okay, there's more space in there. He's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make it smaller or put a bigger battery in or whatever he said, you know, like, um, it sounds a little dangerous actually, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Water is only conductive when it's dirty. Well, a fish tank. Yeah. You know, depends on. Well. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I had a company um, that I started. Actually, you might, you might actually. So the first company I started was in um, early 90s. And it was a company that was in the, uh, another company that was in the semiconductor software business. Okay. And I wrote personally um, the software that was a, a de- an, an integrated debug environment for hardware. So you know what an IDE is, yeah. right? So it was an IDE for hardware, first one. And my first customer was Sun Microsystems, and I, I started a little company. Um, and then we were, all of our customers were in, in the land of, of Unix. Linux didn't really exist. It was um, AIX from IBM or SunOS or Solaris mm-hmm. um, kind of software. I used almost all of those. Yeah. And um, you had email came an online little program to do email and every one of our customers was on email. Okay. Is it like pine or something or uh, yeah, pine was, no, it was just called mail. I think it was like included in all of them. It was just standard mail. And then you could do like an L and it would give you the first yeah. 10 subjects or something and D four to delete number yeah. four and whatever. Okay. Very command line. But everybody used it, and like everybody in the engineering world, in the elect, in the computer design, you know, so my customers were Sun and HP and Compact and and Dell and you know um, Fujitsu and IBM and da 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 da, okay, who bought the IDE for their chip design, and um, but they all every one of my customers and everyone using my software had an email address, okay, so I had this brilliant idea. That I would to spam them. To get it. Yeah, well, I, I, I would send them an email every month, you know, with tips and tricks on how to use the software. And they loved it. And then you built a spam company. And I spam. No, then I built it. But it wasn't really spam because, you know, 
it was it was a listserv and you subscribed. You said I want I want this. I'm just right? I'm just easy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so um so I started this little company. I'm like, "Oh my god, this email thing is going to be big." Okay? And I had this problem that I had this listserv running over here with people subscribing. And then I had this uh FileMaker database running over here on this Mac okay, to keep track of my customers and their orders and stuff. And I'm like, well, how do I synchronize this emails from here to here? Like, because the, you know, somebody changes this email address in the list serve, how do I update it in my customer database? Right? Because this is, you know, there wasn't even a, a field in the, in, the, in the database for email address for the customers. Okay. And so I said, this is going to be a big thing. This email thing is going to be big. And so I started a new company. Okay. Um, and I found the guy who had written the open source listserv software. I forget the name of it. it might've been listserv anyway. And I said, Hey, we should start a company. This email thing's going to be big. We should just commercialize this and let's go hook it up to the CRM systems that all the big boys are using. And then, you know, they can have, a, they can, you know, have newsletters for their customers. Whatever. So we created this company. Anyway, it was in Boston because that was where he was. And it was like five or six guys, four guys that we hired, I hired and they were in this basement. Okay. It was a half basement. It was like this cool brick building. And, you know, and this was in uh, mid nineties and, you know, they're putting together code and they got their, there were no laptops really. Everybody had like, you know, those big PC boxes and then something went wrong and the whole place flooded to like <laughs> four feet of water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and everything's plugged in. Okay. And so these guys go in. Okay to get their computers out of the water and Gosh, try, unplug so them oh. and try to take them out. I was like, no. <laughs> anyway. Did it work? Did they, did they yeah, all salvage yeah. it? Yeah, they were able to salvage it all. Wow. And it, like, like, because I guess it was especially, clean enough water that it didn't conduct. I mean, especially back, well, yeah, but there's also du like, you know, human dust inside the computer. Like There's, there's all like, kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ugh, yeah. No, I would not trust it. Mm -hmm. Well, generally, um, if you soak a computer, as long as you don't turn it on until it's dry, you'll be okay. I've done it a couple times. Yeah, yeah, me too. I've done it the same. I've actually dumped an entire cup of coffee on my laptop and let it dry, and I'm still using it today. Yeah. So there you go. That explains so much, Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oops, that's why yeah, the sorry. That's why the it's why the keys are so sticky. <laughs> That's not what. Um, okay. Well, this has been great. Um, where do people find out about all of these things you're doing? Because uh, it's like a laundry list. <laughs> um, so um, semiconductor design management software is icmanage.com. I, letter I, letter C, M-A-N-A-G-E.com. Um, Brevo, which is the access control uh, from the cloud to get into your building using your phone rather than those key cards is Brivo, B-R-I-V-O.com. Eagle Eye Networks, um, which is cloud-based video surveillance with all this great AI, is uh, E-E-N, Edward, Edward Nancy .com. And uh, Draco Motors uh, is DracoMotors.com, D-R-A-K-O-M-O-T-O-R-S.com. And did I miss any? I think that's all. Uh, Barracuda, if you want to talk about them, nah. <laughs> <laughs> you know ah, uh forget still, those guys. still a good company uh you know uh, still a, a you know a leader in uh, a lot of security stuff so okay going and, strong uh, and how do people get in touch with you if they feel like it um probably the best is um my email uh draco d-r-a-k-o at e-e-n.com awesome well thank you for coming down i really appreciate this this was awesome yeah a lot of fun yeah uh, good conversation and thank you for uh, having me. Yeah, thanks really for appreciate it. Yeah.